Hi everyone. Today we have this announcement of ESM3 and this was introduced by Evolutionary Scale. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover some takeaways from this particular announcement and why it's a really big deal, especially for biology and also for AI in general. And this one was announced by Alex Reeves from Evolutionary Scale. And it says here, ESM3 is a generative language model for programming biology. In experiments, they found ESM3 can simulate 500 million years of evolution to generate new fluorescent proteins. So apparently they found or discovered, generated this new fluorescent proteins. And we're going to go through that in this video and why this particular research and announcement, including a release of a model, is really a big deal and is making the rounds on X and different places in the field of AI. It was also featured by Nat Friedman. So you can see evolutionary scale comes out of stealth and announces ESM3, the largest protein language model trained to date, and demonstrates using it to discover a new fluorescent protein. And it says here, from the rate of diversification of GFPs, Found in nature, we estimate that this generation of a new fluorescent protein is equivalent to simulating over 500 million years of evolution. We're going to get into the details of the announcement in a bit. And obviously, Nat Friedman is one of the people that is backing this team as well. Let's go through the, some of the details of this particular announcement. And as I said, why it's a big deal, especially for the world of AI and biology. And there's also a paper, I'm going to go refer to the paper um, every now and then as I go through this particular announcement and some of the details that I'm excited about. They give a bit of history on the importance of understanding protein, right? Proteins underlie disease and health and many life-saving medicines and proteins. And that's kind of the motivation behind doing this particular research. And they also propose this new preprint. The preprint is available here, and I'm going to again refer to it. This preprint title is Simulating 500 Million Years of Evolution with a Language Model. Now, as some of you may know, um, I've been involved in using LLMs for science. One of the work that I was involved in is this work from Meta when I was there, which is called the Galactica model and something that we did with that paper, and you can still refer to it on archive, it's there, um, is that we try to use different types of data. And, and what we tried to do with that work was trying to see if we could build a more generalized system that can understand the different data that you will find in the different sciences, right? Like chemistry, biology, physics, and so on. Um, and even understanding natural language and code. And so that was one of our attempts, right? I think it's one of the first attempts at trying to use these transformer models to really represent complex data. And I can imagine in biology, I'm not an expert in biology, but I can imagine these complex structures, right? And how do we actually model that with something like a transformer architecture? Now keep in mind, in this work, what they're trying to do is they're proposing a frontier language model for biology, right? So we're borrowing what we have done already in the field of natural language processing, these transformer architectures, which were built, right, to represent data that's natural language data, as opposed to, you know, biology type of data, right? Like proteins and so on. So how do we actually encode that type of structure effectively and efficiently in something like a transformer architecture? This is what they're trying to answer with this line of work. And obviously this is ESM3. There have been other iterations of this as well. And you can find all that work in this particular paper. So all that related work is there. And what I mentioned here is that they describe this generation of a new green fluorescent protein that is referred to as a GFP. And fluorescent proteins are responsible for the glowing colors of jellyfish and corals and are important tools in modern biology. ESM GFP, our new protein, has a sequence that is only 58% similar to the closest known fluorescent protein. So there are many of these fluorescent proteins that already exist. Um, and again, like in this case, they find that some of these proteins are responsible for why some uh, animals actually glow. 
And so from the rate of diversification of GFPs found in nature today, we estimate that this generation of a new fluorescent protein is equivalent to simulating over 500 million years of evolution. And when I read this for the first time, I was like, okay, we have a language model, right? And we are passing it, this data that represents proteins and the structures and the functions and so on and sequences. And by doing that, we're able to simulate, right? over 500 million years of evolution by just using a language model, something that was not even meant to understand this type of data. And so that's really powerful. I think transform architectures are showing that they can be used for different domains and different modalities, right? So like in image generation, they can be used for like representing graphs, they can be used for representing pretty much anything that we have out there being that they're so general purpose, right? It's not a surprise to me as well that it was used here in this type of work, right? The language model was used to represent like protein structures, sequences, and functions, which are important to understand what biology is. And, and that's kind of what they're trying to do here and using it as a tool. They refer to ESM3 as a frontier language model for biologists is what I was saying earlier. And it's the first generative model for biology that simultaneously reasons over the sequence structure and functions of proteins. So these are passed as inputs to this model, and this model basically uh, models this type of data, right? And creates representations that can be used to study closely sequence structure and functions of proteins to better understand, maybe even discover proteins, as was the case in this work. I mentioned here that the ESM tree is trained across the natural diversity of the earth, billions of proteins from the Amazon rainforest to the depths of the oceans, extreme environments like hydrothermal vents, and the microbes in a handful of soil. Now, something that's very uh, well known with this type of data is that it's very uncommon, right? It's very hard to actually collect this type of data. So what they have done in this work is also use synthetic data, which was interesting to me. Somewhere in the paper, they mentioned that. They mentioned here, trained on one of the highest throughput GPU clusters in the world today, ESM3 is a frontier generative model for biology created at the leading edge of parameters, computational power, and data. We believe that ESM3 is the most compute ever applied to a training biological model trained with over 1, 10 to 24 flops and 98 billion parameters. And they also mentioned something about scaling here and the importance of scaling, right? Obviously, with the smaller models, you have capabilities, but as you scale these models, something that has been shown is these emerging capabilities. And they also noted those in this particular work. So that's something that was also very interesting. Um, and you can go through all the different bits of this blog post. I'm not going to go through every section but one thing that stood out for me is this ability to reason over the sequence structure and function of proteins by essentially combining these different modalities right these are could be considered different modalities although it is about proteins right you can consider different modalities and these are the ones that are encoded in this particular trans uh, architecture that is made of transformer blocks. And something that they also use here is this geometric attention mechanism, and that's to represent like coordinates, which is really important in this type of data. And as I mentioned earlier, right, they augment this multimodal training data set with hundreds of millions of synthetic data points, including predictive structures and functions for diverse sequences. They can name here something called programming biology, right? It makes biology more programmable. It can follow prompts to generate new proteins, and this can interact with ESM3, guiding it to create a more myriad of applications such as medicine, biology research, and clinology. Having a model that can represent this type of data, now you can use it for various types of applications, right? Similarly to when we train a natural language model, we can use it for summarization of emails, summarization of legal documents, financial documents, whatever that may be. It's the same thing here, right? And I like this concept of programming biology because being able to represent this type of data and allowing a model to have an understanding of how that data is structured and what's the nature of that data, I think there are a lot of things that can emerge, right? We can, in this case, what they showed is that they can discover proteins, but there are other things that they can also do here. And there are a couple of examples on some interesting applications that they were talking about here. And you can find them in the paper as well. 
there's also like a nice video about it, like talking about the different applications. So that's really interesting. Now I want to go back here and talk about this emergence of capabilities with scale, right? So they did different experiments. Um, they also tried to align a model, this preference tune model. And what they noticed is that, yeah, as the models were scaled, right? They had and showed more capabilities and better performance on what they were modeling. One thing they noticed is that as they aligned these models, you can see how it significantly boosted the performance of some of these tests that they were testing on, right? And that's remarkable because uh, we are using these alignment techniques like reinforcement learning from human feedback to improve these models, right? To make them better at understanding human preferences and so on, but can also be applied to biology as well. And it has an application there because it allows for deeper exploration and more intuitive exploration of this type of data. And so that was interesting to me and, and they talk about it more in the paper. So a lot of details in the paper, if you want to go into more details on that. Um, and so what stood out here is this discovery of this green fluorescent protein that they are announced. You can see here on the front page, right? Fluorescent proteins are beautiful in their complexity. They are responsible for vibrant colors in jellyfish and corals and have become a powerful tool in biology. With ESMG, we were able to design ESMG FP, a novel version of the green fluorescent protein. Generated by ESM3 with chain of thought prompting, ESMGFP is a vast evolutionary departure from natural fluorescent proteins. It will have taken nature 500 million years to evolve this protein. Uh, but somehow they discovered it right in this work. And so that really represents something really that I would consider a breakthrough in biology specifically with the application of large language models in science. I don't think we have had something like this for language models in biology. And so that's why I wanted to do a video on this and just to kind of build awareness about this because I think this is an incredible achievement and incredible research work. And I like that they're using these concepts like chain of thought prompting and how that kind of elicited reasoning as well. So things that we know work for natural language also seem to transport over to the biology domain as well, right? In this complex type of data that they're using. And so you can check out the paper here from all the authors. Uh, there are a lot more details in the paper. They go through what the uh, architecture was, right? How did they come up with the objective function as well? And how did they deal with the different uh, modalities that they were dealing with, the sequences, the structure, and the functions of the proteins, and why that was important to encode all of that. It, this is a bidirectional transformer. It was important that it was like this because not only is this about representation learning, it's also about generative modeling as well, right? For the different applications that they spoke of for the objective function, what they use was this idea, mask language modeling objective. I won't go through all the details of the paper, but I think it's an interesting one. I read through it and understood that this is a very important research. It's an exciting new era of AI and the application of large language models. And I like the idea of using chain of thought again, as I mentioned, not throwing away all of those ideas and having these aligned models as well that allow them to do more with these models for this type of application. So do check that out. So this is the rendering of the ESM GFP, a new green fluorescent protein generated by ESM3 that is distant from other fluorescent proteins found in nature. So this is one example, right? And also like, it's not so easy to explore and discover the things with these models. We may have a model, but again, we don't really have complete understanding of these systems as well, inter what internally they are representing. And so I think with better understanding of these models, also we're gonna have better ways and application and tools for how to apply this in areas like biology, maybe even discover more different type of proteins for different important applications. So that will be a, like a quick summary of this work. I think it's amazing. This is why large language models is exciting because it's being applied everywhere in different domains, right? It's not just for natural language tasks, but it seems that it can be applied for different sciences as well, like astronomy, right? And, and biology, physics, chemistry, whatever that may be. And so I'm really excited about all these developments and hope to be covering a few more of these in the future. 
but I will highly encourage everyone to take a look at this and to stay up to date with what's happening also in the life sciences and how LLMs and AI are being applied there and why this type of work is important there to have better tools to understand, you know, even the most complex structures that are, exist in the world and in particular, right, how we can build good computational tools for scientists to be able to do more profound work and deeper work into better understanding, you know, life as it is and better understand how to uh, cure diseases, right, how to, like, create better medicines. Thank you so much for tuning in for this one, and I'll see you in the next one.